So the problem of the body here, of course, is a lingual problem, linguistic problem, what it represents in terms of culturally shared consensus. And what was my further um, kind of amazement is how there is this disparity between these being spiritual circles. These were supposed to be areas where there is a greater all-encompassing understanding and perspectives. Yet when it came to the body, the language is kind of immediately agrees with the perspectives that already held by, let's say, a prevalent conversation in allopathic medicine, a prevalent conversation in how the body is viewed in terms of this mechanistical laws of nature. So in other words, that conversation, the quantum conversation, doesn't enter except for a few examples. One being someone like John Hagelin, of course, who comes straight from uh, where perhaps the most profound teachings of the 20th, end of the 20th century were delivered under the encouragements of His Holiness Maharishi Mahesh Yogi to bring the end to that disparity, to the inconsistency in terms of what even existed in the tradition where Maharishi himself was coming from, so as to bring to some kind of conclusive um, view, perspective, all that was present in Indian culture, in variety of its pockets and ways, in terms of what the Vedic culture really represents, because we know very well that the attitude and understanding of Vedic sciences, like Vedic sciences, science of astrology, science of placement, science of uh, how to maintain balance and longevity, science of sound and its impact on our well-being, and so forth. All these disciplines were scattered, they were there, they were there, guarded maybe by small clan, family, tribe, passed from, from heart to heart, but they were pretty much isolated. This was already highlighted by um, Shri Aurobindo Ghosh, and Shri Aurobindo hinted on many occasions that these are not just a byproduct of imagination, these are the thoughts of God cast in language so as to remain there as the guiding light for generations to come if they will have access to this, what is encoded in these scriptures, to put it this way. So, it takes another, whatever, 50 years perhaps, until Maharishi Mahesh Yogi completes that through the brilliance of then still young neurophysiologist Tony Nader, who uh, I believe a graduate was a graduate of Harvard University or Stanf Stanford University, I'm not quite sure which one, but he studied in the United States. And he came to Maharishi quite um, early on in his life. This coincided with the early 90s. And immediately was inspired to embark on this work to allocate all the sounds known in Vedic literature as the very works as the very uh, specific aspects of Vedic literature with the entire neurophysiology of a human being. So, after several years of this very focused research, 
Tony Nader, under direct guidance of Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, came up with this book entitled Um, I just want to make sure I give justice to the exact title. I think it's something along the lines of Veda as expressed through human physiology. We will tweak that, don't worry, we will give the exact title. And of course it wasn't widely available, it was only available inside and within the movement. A very large coffee, format, coffee table format volume, fully illustrated, where every physiological aspect of our body, a full nervous system, everything is given this scrutiny where the superimposition of all terms was given. On one table of content, in not content, table of each of these, let's say, maps of the, let's say, the part which comprises the central nervous system, which of course is all the uh, vertebrates of spine allocating this with the principal work Rig Veda. Uh, each sukta of the Rig Veda corresponds to particular functioning of each vertebra, which we know each vertebra through its complex network is then connects to the functioning of all the limbs and organs corresponding to the functioning of this particular vertebra. All this is then given names, medical names, and alongside Vedic names, names in Sanskrit. So, I used to know them by heart, by the way, all the 40 aspects of Veda I expressed there, starting, starting with Rig Ved, Sam Ved, Yajur Ved, Athar Ved, and then it goes. And all of the 40 aspects all of the 40 aspects, and how that correlates to the entirety of the human body. So the, the very thesis of that work was to come up with a complete system where that perennial understanding, which is, by the way, unique to Indian culture per se, it has been coming out only to go underground, resurfacing again, only to go out and only to resurface again throughout its entire long history, that concept of body being cosmic in essence. Human body is an expression of cosmos. And here it is the confirmation of that term, human body is an expression of knowledge. The human body here is an expression of Veda. That exclamation, Aham Vedam, I am Veda. In other words, I am knowledge. Knowledge here is spoken in terms of totality of knowledge. Aham Vedam, I am Veda. In other words, what Maharishi always taught is that knowledge is structured in consciousness. The knowledge itself is structured in consciousness. So we know something, not by virtue of knowing its parts, but because it is a fundamental quality of our consciousness. So the knowledge here, in true sense, is the union of the knower and known. Hence, this is where Maharishi, giving it to the English language spoke about these terms, Vedic terms, which we uh, began to give a greater and greater emphasis in our work uh, under the umbrella of Trikashaivism. This is that trinity of seer, seeing and seen, or observer, observing and 
that what is observed. The dynamic relationship between subject and object is exemplified in this trinity of seer, seeing and seen. So, to complete this, Maharishi felt very strongly that in the age of science, in the age of reason that we are living pretty much in, something is required to convince, let's say, those who are in a position to make changes, those who are in a position to understand and utilize this, by allocating and showing that there is already a perfect map of consciousness, and the human body is that. The human body here is literally the image of awareness, the image of God, in, if given to that theological language. So the human body here is not body in the sense of that reductionistic point of view of a physical structure where some kind of processes take place, where perhaps allopathic medicine reached a very, very high level of understanding where it can emulate, replicate, replace in some cases, assist these processes, increase some activity, decrease another activity. Certainly, we have to give due to the level of mechanical intervention that the modern science affords these days. However, the goal of that work, which unfortunately, unfortunately for all of us, did not gain enough attention for it to facilitate a true revolution, because that's what it was aimed to do. It could have, effectively speaking, completely, completely replaced the whole entire allopathic medicine with the pharma, big pharma, or the whole pharmacological industry in terms of the applicational methodologies for what and how human health met, meant to be maintained. Because the human physiology was presented here in light of conscious understanding. That the human body here is comprised of sounds. And Veda is all about sounds. And all these different sounds are this progressive progressive stages of manifestation where it is then crystallized into what we then refer to as the human body. But in reality, they all remain to be sounds. So therefore, Vedic approach to health is sound-based and it's a sound approach. So, That the ultimate understanding, there were technologies even brought, which did not gain light. They were only introduced sometimes in the 90s. I do remember it myself very well, where a certain sounds meant to be utilized. And the best sound, as we know, is a human voice. Of all the musical instruments in the pantheon of classical Indian music, the number one, the first instrument, is considered to be human voice. And if we are to tr believe the musicologists of India, that all instruments, without exception, are to emulate as close as possible the capacity and the ranges of vocal expressions. This is to, to give you some further reflections on the nature of the work that spontaneously unfolds here in the much more orchestrated manner as we witnessing a literally a phenomena of how it becomes more and more widespread. The vocalizations among those in whom a greater activity of consciousness begins to take place. This is just a, a, a footnote. We can come back to this in the, a dedicated time. So, 
I just wanted to first and foremost to pay tribute to the greatest, perhaps, legacy of Maharishi Mahesh Yogi to complete this centuries-old dilemmas, centuries-old speculations with regard to the A, origins of Vedic literature and the true import and value in terms of what they actually represent. Because at, even at a glance and attempts were made to do exactly that, Tony Nada, upon completing this work, work, was ceremonially given his weight in gold. Actually, scales were created. Uh, a large scales were created, these old-fashioned scales, where Tony Nada sat on one and then gold was placed on another until it will equalize. That in itself, some people roll their eyes, you know, like because rolling of the eyes, it's the, you know, it's the, because we always know better, right? And we, we, we are driven by pragmatism and the lack of uh, sometimes of imagination. And it's like, give him a Nobel Prize, you know, something. No, no, only gold will do. That in itself also, also was a sim symbolical gesture. It's given to someone who completed this work, but human being, weight of human being is pure gold here. Gold represents the most precious, at least most precious metal in the value scale, which never lost its value. So, Gold has always remained in vogue, doesn't matter what epoch. So this Tony Nader receives his weight in gold, symbolized here the level of the achievement, but also simultaneously further illustrated the very nature of that work. And I do remember because it just happened Again, this is just purely like a footnote. It's not, uh, it, it, you know. Um, during those years, I was very close to a family who introduced Tony Nader to Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. Susan and Amar Hamza, Hamza from Lebanon, they were then still living in London. In fact, uh, Hardly known to anyone, young Deepak Chopra stayed in their house repeatedly on all his trips to London. Back then still a, a member of the TM movement. And uh, so, and through very close connections, I've met Susan first and then her husband. And Susan is of this, was of the same age as my mother, in fact, this very same year and the very same month, just different days. February of 1934, and there was this very strong connection. And um, so I, I was often invited to her house for uh, various gatherings. And of course, you know, I've met a lot of people. I've met, I was very privileged to meet someone like Dr. Vernon Katz, who was a, an eminent Sanskritist already at the time in Maharishi first came to the United Kingdom, and it was Dr. Vernon Katz who worked with Maharishi closely on the translation and interpretation of the Bhagavad Gita and later that of Brahma Sutras. The Brahma Sutras remained unpublished and only went into print in two volumes. The first, I think, was in 2000. 10, because I remember receiving that copy before going to Costa Rica, and that copy was with me then. So, and, and anyway, like meeting Vernon Katz was like, I knew his voice because of the tapes, him actually reading the verses from the Gita, and he's this, like, it's a beautiful English accent with the deep voice of a rich actor, of like, you know, this baritone. That slight, that, that ever so slight Jewish accent, you know, that British Jewish baritone, 
and then uh, the elucidation was given by uh, someone else, uh, a lesser known person. Um, so I, I knew, of course, the, who, do, uh, who Dr. Vernon Katz was, and so meeting him then, celebrating Guru Purnima's Maharishi's birthdays in the house of Susan Hamza was a treat. It was a real treat. So I knew from the family that Tony Nader was given this task to travel the world. The very first copy he presented was to then Prime Minister of India. There are photographs of that where he paid tribute and he presented the first copy to the Prime Minister of India, Prasad Varma, I think that's his name. Um, some of them I remember very well. Others, I forget the names. Uh, we will look it up also. We'll fill the dots if you're interested. So this was, you could see that these attempts were made to present this work at the highest possible level for those who have ears, eyes, and intellect to grasp and see that this is pure gold. It literally, potentially, ushered, or could have ushered, an entire new era in understanding of what this human body is. But the fate would have it otherwise. A death and death, death silence fell on the reception of this book. The book was not supposed to be sold from shop windows or airports. It was meant to be sold to those who have reached the level of understanding, potentially in also verified by personal experiences of some sort. So among the families of meditators, among those leaders of society who already have hopefully consciousness exalted to the level to lead. But as I said, unfortunately, it seems the time was not ready. And this book remains to be a passing commentary on our time. But if you look into this book, as I said, it's so richly illustrated. It also, every Hindu should have that book in their library to understand what Hinduism is. Every single Hindu to alleviate the level of understanding on a incomparably greater level would be advised to look into this. For example, why the iconography of Ganesh is as we know it? Why? What a, what a strange, if not weird, um, deity. Right? Elephant head. But there are pictures, anatomical pictures, of the sagittal view from here of the entrance into the skull, of the anatomical structure, not profile view, you know, section, not frontal, not above, but this one, where Ganesh represents these qualities in human physiology that are responsible for all functioning, absolutely all functioning that connects the so-called cerebral cortex and all the cortex's activities with the rest of the body. And now put this next to, uh, align that with the myth. Who is the Ganesh? Ganesh is, is the one who is at the entrance to the chamber of Shiva and Parvati. He is the son. Yeah, the myth goes, of course, that Shiva, because he walked on the amorous interlude, and Shiva was very displeased, and he, you know, took his head off and dismembered, basically, the poor little guy. His own son. And Parvati, of course, gone vicious, and, you know, like, 
this is it, man, you, you're out. So, like, you know, you do whatever you want, but not going to work now. So, of course, she had to do something, but he, he, he found the body, but not the head. So, okay, need to put something. So he took an elephant and got the head of the elephant and Shiva's powers, obviously, unlimited. So he conjoined it and there was a deity, Ganesh. See? But the essence of the job of Ganesh, he is the keeper of the Ganas. That's what Ganesh means, or Ganapati. Keeper of the Ganas. You know this term, Ganas? Ganas? No? Yes. Yes, it's the, it's the digits, it's the numbers. It's the keeper of the rhythm. It's the keeper of this pulsating rhythm of this absolutely all, all neurophysiological activity where that connection between the so-called body-mind takes place. So he is indeed at the chamber of Shiva and Parvati. He is the one who keeps the Ganas. He keeps it all in place. Nobody can pass this. And there is this, this a, an actual precise anatomic diagram drawing like that shows that. And it like astonishingly, pictorially, a representation of, it looks like a head of an elephant, a trunk, ears, everything. And so the whole book is illustrated like that. The whole book. Like, everything is given this, like each part, each particular part of the Vedas. Like when we spoke at some point, remember even during this immersion, the part known as Dhanur Ved. Dhanur is the art of archery. Right? Dhanur is the art of archery. So this is precisely the part that corresponds to this autonomic nervous system that is responsible for all what is happening in the body spontaneously. And meditation here is then the art of drawing back to that, essentially the art of archery here, dhanur, is to represent that what meditation here stands for in terms of its neurophysiological activity. It's where everything is drawn back into the natural, encoded by nature, activity which is not and does not require mental uh, mentation of any kind. You see? It simply doesn't require a mind at all. And Gandharvaved, Gandharvaved, for example, it's a whole term, and the Gandharva Ved is very well known. Everyone who has um, delved into the origins of Indian classical music, or classical Indian music, knows that at the base of all Indian classical music is Gandhar, Gandharva Veda, or that whole notion of Gandharva, the realm, the so-called realm of the Gandharvas, celestial beings. Uh, there is a very clear understanding that uh, melodies are not born to human imagination in Indian culture, among the educated, those who, let's say, give their life to the study and uh, becoming virtuosos in the given craft and art, that no melody ever invented by any human being. Melodies are received, downloaded. And the Gandharva Ved region from where the download comes at that so-called level of the lore, 
mythology, how it's spoken for many, many centuries was that this is where the area of these celestial beings who are all embedded with tremendous sense of harmony. Mm -hmm. And if they are willing so, then they will be essentially sharing some of that with us earthlings. So the gifted musicians are those who ha somehow have been in direct connection, contact or inspiration from these Gandharvas. But a more modern take on that, kind of, let's say, elucidated term on the uh, understanding of that is that Gandharva Ved here represents the pacemaking quality within our neurophysiology. Pacemaking. So in other words, our body is already here programmed to all to perceive and to function at the level of harmonious rhythms. Yes. And melody, the reason why we perceive melody in the first place, and why each and every melody is in certain resonance of how it then associated with moods it gives rise to, is all because of that functioning of the nervous system within the neurophysiology that is known as the pacemaker. It's that what is already, every little cell here, we could say dances, some under some kind of tune. Every cell, every fiber of our being is already programmed to vibrate. So, in a way, in a way, there is no such thing like, oh, I only like to listen Chopin, or, mm, you know what, you know, like, yes, I appreciate the reggae music, but it's not for me. This is, this, uh, this is when we begin to confuse completely what's going on. In the, in the being in whom these, let's say, portals are open and functioning, there's no problem in being, uh, in savoring the most cerebral music, which will be perceived, perhaps, and assisting this sense of transcendence and certainly energy is all will be concentrated into these apertures to, like, all expansive, upward movement. At the same time, if there is a drumming, if there is some rhythm, you want to get up and dance, man, you know? You want to just, like, your body will begin to move, you know? It's like, it, it has to move. I mean, this is what it designed to do. So the reggae, you know, like, it, you, you know, of course you need to also do some squats in the morning because you're not going to last a, a, a track, I'm sorry. You know, you have to have your knees bent, you know, and like, even our three and a half year old, she already practicing the, all the shaking and all the, in the right places because she knows this is the family she grows up, grows up and, you know, it's in, it's in the gene and, you know, it's also encouraged. It's like, you know, we're not ashamed of shaking our booty. It's a, it's beautiful, it's wonderful, and it's like connecting, you know, it's really. So, it on, the discrepancy only here is when we suddenly start mentating about it. You know, let's go dance. No, I'm not ready. Uh, next, next track. Next, like, okay. Uh, okay, a few more tequilas. <laughs> like, you know, to loosen up, you know, like, well, okay. Take your tequilas then to loosen up. But if you are already loosened up, you can dance on pure water. You know, you don't need gin and tonic. You can just have a coconut water and you'll be just as drunk on the sound as you can, simply because this is already the part of how we are designed, how we function. So the Gandharva Ved is represent, representing this particular quality of our awareness structured throughout neurophysiology. And that in turn, our nervous physiology is structured in consciousness. Do you see these two movements? These beautiful movements. One is the emission projection of awareness where it structures itself through this neurophysiology, where 
in turn it is structured in consciousness. This is the beautiful gift to humanity, back offered freely. But you see, we are still, still somewhere where it takes a long time, it takes a long, long time to somehow to even to begin to consider. So, you know, like you can just imagine, you know, maybe Indian uh, president, not president, the prime minister opened the book and it's like, you know, opened the book, looked at it, fascinating, yes, but what can I do with it? Right? What can I do with it? What, I'm going to now declare independence from the rest of the world? Some of the richest families in India are all pharma plugged in. India is a producer of some of the most widely consumed drugs in the world. And they're also inexpensively produced. They're cheaper in India than in the Switzerland. Their taxpayers, their friends, family connections, cousins. <clears throat> Thank you, Tony Nader. Mm -hmm. Nice work. Don't even tempt me. See? So again, <clears throat> I don't want to. I don't want to. I, we, we ought to wrap it up, and I don't want to kind of. I, I wanted to deliver it in a, without quirky part of, of this of this nervous system. So. Unfortunately, it signals again and again that there are still a lot of... The system is still clogged. Our collective consciousness still carries a lot of stresses in the system. Because if this is recognized for what it is, nothing should stop a being in a position of power. Any kind of power to bring this into manifestation. Because this is our job. As soon as we recognize value in something, it is our job to make it available to others. It, it's, it's a primal responsibility of why we're here, because we are social beings and the very quality of what it means to live a fulfilling life is in that what is constantly here experienced through this sharing, interaction. So knowledge of such degree should be immediately at least considered to made available to those who can re-educate themselves, <clears throat> reevaluate their approaches. Maybe it will take a time of transition. Yes, I understand, and I spoke about it with an example, that a drastic example of the families who grow up generation up and generation of those who make weapon from any kind of weapon to weapon of mass destruction there has to be a point of check there has to be a point where a generation that is to inherit this business would say enough is enough i don't care who is threatening our country our world i don't want this to be our family dharma. Maybe the language is differently used. I want this to be changed. Okay? And I'm willing to go into tremendous length to make it happen. It's a hero. This would be a hero. A hero of our time who in that kind of setting will be able to go against tremendous current. The same way here the example maybe less drastic, but equally as, as acute with regard to what we consider to be our healthcare system. If our healthcare system is based on profiting from suffering and illness, then it's the rotten system there and then. Utterly and entirely rotten. It meant to be replaced and there has to be a transition, an understanding. I'm born into this family. I will confine with some. I will bring my sister into my side, my cousin. I'll speak to my uncle. He had some kind of enlight illumination, you know. He's a pious man. He will understand. And then we'll, whenever is the next time, the board of 
you know, trustees get together. You know, folks, we have to begin to dismantle this because we have to rearrange it. It's in our hands. Yes, I'm the one who inherited this and enjoy all this extraordinary level of what you have built. Thank you very much. And I'm willing to take a blow. I may not make as many billions and I may have to tie the belt at the, that level of the relative kind of, let's say, of what is applied here, but I'm willing to bring these changes. This is a sign of intelligence, sign of clearly see things for what they are. And not just that I hope, I know that this is happening right at this very moment, right at this very moment. Whenever there is a harmony in our room, this harmony fills the environment and those who are literally born into the position to make these changes, their consciousness is exposed to these vibrations. When vibrations is dense around, when vibrations are dense, then these people are all programmed. Programmed. They only follow the patterns. But when the vibrations begin to change, there is a possibility to some light enters and somehow it begins to bring the possibility of some radical reevaluation of how things ought to function. So I thought to bring this and this is uh, maybe meant to serve as an introduction to the theme that we are entering now, the theme of how can these methodologies, in our particular case, let's say, re-establishing, because these visualizations are to re-establish the divine status to the body, which carries the imprint. And there are two primary influences. At the biological level, it is subjected to the evolution of how we live as human beings. Because as we go through these changes and what we call progress, our body undergoes this um, some kind of modulations when we progressively lose our connection to the natural world because we overtake the natural environment. We're no longer dependent upon it in the obvious manner. So we can hit the buildings, structure, these, these, you know, we are no longer confined to the limitations of climates, geography, seasons, right? So this is therefore already a prolonged period of time. So that's one influence. And another influence that imprints our both understanding of the body and body itself is the so-called cultural indoctrination. What we are programmed to think and how we relate to the body. So the noble goal here of tantric philosophy and practice is to free body from these impositions. It's to give body a chance to tap into that, what it represents here, truly. To free it from this collectively held samskaras, which act in turn on each and every individual, on each and every one of us. So as to overcome that predicament and to introduce the possibility where that perennial view of the body being nothing short of the conglomerate or gathering of divine forces, divine powers, can be given a cognition then based on direct direct realization of that fact through 
verification of this knowledge.